I thought I'd just talk about some of the broader challenges in the sector under this heading of economic, social, environmental sustainability. I feel like we've done environmental sustainability quite well, but some other economic uh, and social challenges um, that the whole sector uh, is going to face. Our credentials, Constructing Excellence is a uh, UK-based uh, but now international organisation promoting um, better industry performance. Um, and we find that we particularly promote better collaborative working to deliver that. And I'm going to explain my terms. Um, UK network, 40 best practice clubs around the United Kingdom. Um, the, U the international network has been very valuable to us in understanding which are the leading construction industries in the world. And it is a pleasure to see Professor Saki here because three times study tours to Japan. Japan is the most efficient construction industry in the world in our measurements. And I was there, unfortunately, when uh, the disaster happened. Uh, looking at nuclear power stations, it was all a bit too close for comfort. Um, my work, yeah, goes back to Martin with BRE actually uh, before that, but uh, the Latham report in 94 and the Egan report in 98, there was a change of government uh, in, bet in between. Um, as a result of that, we started measuring through the construction industry key performance indicators. And just to show you what progress the construction industry made over the last 10 years, Client satisfaction, if you're to ask clients on a scale of 0 to 10, what, what would you give as a score your last project? Client satisfaction in the UK across all sectors is up by 30% over those 10, uh, 20%, sorry, 63 to 80 is about uh, 20%. Safety is up, that is to say accident rates are down by 30% in construction. As previous speakers have said, until that figure is consistently zero, we've still a long way, way to go. But nevertheless, the industry culture is changing and uh, safety is um, a, uh, benefiting from that. We have over 500 demonstration projects contributing a lot of evidence. That is when we compare the whole industry, whether it's environmental performance, social performance and economic performance. These demonstration projects which have sought to sp have set out to prove there are better ways of doing things have outperformed on all measures over the last 10 years. Uh, collaborative working has three dimensions. A lot of people think collaborative working is the touchy-feely stuff of being nice to each other. It's not at all remotely commercial. It's all about negotiated business and higher margin and all that. And actually, it is a lot about touchy-feely stuff and trust and openness and honesty. It's a lot about common vision and leadership. Why actually we, are we all working together on this construction project? And what is the goal that we're on? And a lot of it's about hard commercial behaviours. And I want to, uh, at a point later on, I want to talk a little bit about that. It's a delicate balance uh, of those three issues. One of the trends at the moment, which is steamrolling its way at you, as you know only too well, is BIM. I prefer the acronym Business Information Management, but it actually stands for Building Information Modelling. It's not just a technical thing, although it is a way of sharing digital data throughout the design team. It is very much the thing the technology will support collaborative processes. It will also help you bugger up the normal process just to, just to do it a little bit faster if that's how you want to do it. We see it as a vital tool for enabling collaborative working. Combination of people issues, technology issues and, and, and process. Let me talk a little bit. Let me take us down before a builder's back up again. Market conditions are grim in UK construction. Um, not the clearest slide, but um, blue is new build uh, activity uh, over the last 60 years. Um, and when Latham published his report, we were in uh, this bit here. Uh, so a, a depth of recession rather similar to the one that we're in, or that we were in, um, just about there. Um, Study that very closely, you'll see we're not in a double dip recession, our industry is in a triple dip recession. And probably not going to pick up this year. The sectors that are picking up undoubtedly, if we're in infrastructure, great news for concrete. Infrastructure is, in relative terms, a boom sector. And set fair if we get the nuclear program approved and if water continues with the program it's got, it's got there. Um, public sector construction is now coming through as, as, as a dramatically reduced sector. The, outlook for the, sec the industry as a whole entirely dependent on the state of the housing market. It's 50% of construction anyway. Until the market conditions for housing change, construction is going to be struggling into 2013-2014. I'm afraid. It may not in relative terms be the critical factor uh, for yourselves, but that's the way it is. 
this emphasis on sustainability and this lack of money that is around, and that includes just the lack of finance. There is money around, but the models for, for financing are not so clever for accessing it. We're involved in some work on PFI, or rather what the next generations of PFI will be. Um, this red sector will grow. In relative terms, there will be more work on repair and maintenance. Apart from anything else, the carbon challenge means it's existing buildings that are the problem in uh, energy consumption terms, not new build in relative terms. We've pretty much cracked new build. What we're going to do about the 20 million homes which are already built that will still be lived in in 2050 if we're going to hit these carbon targets. It's that rollout of Green Deal and all of that stuff that is uh, uh, going to grow the red sector and take us more to being um, a, a sector focused on um, um, repair maintenance as much as new build. So it's a major threat to the sector. Um, and before I reflect on that, let me just say one or two words about government policies. Um, plan for growth. Plan for growth is remarkable because it is the first time that a number 10 and number 11 have said that construction is a key driver of the economy. And you can see this going back to the Labour government. They did invest when we saw the housing market crash. They did try to invest in public sector construction. That's why we have the pipeline that came through on schools and, and hospitals in part. So they have acknowledged that and they have listened to the argument that in a recession you invest in infrastructure. It's all very well. It doesn't create short-term jobs. It takes a long time to get infrastructure projects off the shelf and through the planning system. What we could have done with, and may yet see, is mobilisation of the Green Deal initiatives much quicker because repair and maintenance work to existing housing is a much more labour-intensive activity. So if you're trying to do it to get money moving quickly and if you're trying to do it to get jobs, you invest in the repairs and maintenance sector not in infrastructure. But hey-ho, the fact that infrastructure is being seen as strategically important is the first time in my lifetime that we have had that level of uh, profile. £2.84, tremendously successful lobbying argument, worth looking through it for any sector at all. For every pound invested in construction, you get £2.84 of economic impact. Two stats in that, for you just as uh, important, it's only for total construction, only something like 8% is imports. We have a domestic industry. Invest in construction, you are investing in British jobs, to, to coin a phrase. This sort of lobbying by the UK Contractors Group undoubtedly had an effect on this current government, hence the investments uh, in infrastructure. Good work by government on the client strategy. Paul Morell, as Chief Construction Advisor, has made a big difference to the uh, common sense, frankly, have been de demonstrated by some of, 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 of the ministers. We've touched very briefly, I won't in the time available, uh, touch on the arguments and the policies for, for low carbon. I think it must be questionable whether government is maintaining its commitment to those strategies. I do agree with uh, one or two, the sentiments, at least, of one or two of the previous speakers. I think there's little doubt in their procurement policies that you see a relative watering down of the targets for low carbon, zero carbon public sector buildings by 2019. It's, the tra trajectory isn't there because the money isn't there. Because not, the money isn't there and they've got the balance of procurement wrong, they're not going to hit that trajectory by, uh, in, in time. Big business opportunities in, in, in that. Let me come back then to collaborative working. What do you do about that? We wrote a report called Never Waste a Good Crisis. The uh, Mandarin for crisis, correct me if I'm wrong, is a combination of two characters, the character for danger and the character for opportunity. I used to think that was a management myth, a uh, management guru myth, but apparently it, it, it isn't. Um, you've got a stark choice. If you're a business in this type of economy, you either keep the faith, you go for pure innovation, you, you, you innovate your way out of the recession, now is the time to rethink and do something different, or you hunker down and go su for survival. And what has happened, every, um, and a lot of contractors in the sector, uh, indeed, some of the clients um, have gone for the left turn. Uh, or, if you like, a reversion to type. We've wound the clock back. It feels a little bit, for me, like some Groundhog Days from the, from the late 1990s. I've seen this stuff before. We're seeing some of the same very, very short-term commercial behaviours, which may or may not um, succeed. I'm not going to have time to uh, cover um, 
the sort of uh, illustrations of, of some of that stuff. We are storing up, or, or the, those who are taking that short-term view have got a very nasty two years to come as materials prices come up against them and they're fixed into suicidal or at least lower than economic prices. Um, we have not seen the bottom of insolvencies in the contracting sector yet. That will come a year after the market picks up. So uh, how am I going to pick us up out of this uh, little uh, spiral of, of uh, uh, depression at the, at the end of the day? Those are the themes that we think the modern industry needs to do, needs to, needs to focus on. Understanding value in the built environment, you're focusing on low carbon as, as you, you have done. Developing a whole new generation of leaders. Understanding how we get the value out of universities like Loughborough on the research side and the education side, but how you create a career-long development of, 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 of people from university into, so that there is this culture of... Um, or this set of attitudes around innovation, research, environmental uh, consciousness, and so on and so forth. Um, and new business models that promote change. It's a broken industry. The way we procure is just not... Uh, the way we put teams together um, around the world to build construction teams is just not efficient enough. There are six critical success factors just worth quickly commenting on. Um, of which we put this slide together in 2001. This is 10 years old. The data has never changed. The headlines, bullets have never changed. Any product manufacturer will tell you the most important thing in making collaborative working is early involvement, early involvement, early involvement. You get us involved early enough in the design process, we can give you ideas. The point was made in another context by at least two previous, previous speakers. Actually, it doesn't matter who you are in the construction process, you want early involvement. And the way we procure stops it. You've even shown an out-of-date process model for the industry which says design, procure, construct. So anyone involved in construction is not involved in the design. Brilliant, who thought of that? The answer is the industry did actually in the 1960s. Those are the sorts of process models we put together. We thought lowest price tendering was a good idea. Not, not, it wasn't the clients that invented that stuff. Modern commercial arrangements which create alignment. If I want a good building and I've given you the lowest price, the only way for you to make money is to start screwing me. Out of that will come a bad building. I will lose and you will lose. Brilliant. I design a contract where you make more money, the better building you give me, we both win. And without having time to go into that challenge, um, <laughs> we wrote this as a contra as a contra argument. Just download it off our website. Suffice it to say, in our opinion, there is very little business case for lowest price tendering. There are too many pitfalls. You have to make too many allowances for extra sums that wouldn't be necessary to add in, not least the legal fees that you're going to sue me for. Um, and uh, please, pl please, please do have a look at, look at that. Um, let me finish with the 15200 argument. What the client really wants, Arup did an exercise in the late 1990s. If you spent £1 million on, office, on an office building in London, over 20 years you'd spend £5 million on operating it, on the FM costs, on the energy costs, on the cleaning costs and all, all of that stuff. I'm paying for the money actually as well. Um, and by comparison, the people in the business occupying that building would cost you 200 million. So the true cost of a building, of occupying a building over 20 years, is 1 plus 5 plus 200. Um, adding two more numbers, which is it costs about 0.1 on that scale to design the thing in the first place, and bear in mind with all the supply chain involved in that design process, in a good process, um, and those people are there to make a lot of money. These are London city centre office buildings, in those days occupied by banks, who in those days made a lot of money. Um, 2,000 to point one, 20,000 to one ratio of value to the design input. Some smart ass quantity surveyor thinks it's a good idea to appoint his or her design team on the basis of a lowest price. To say 0.001 presumably on this scale. 
thereby ensuring that the amount of quality time that can be put into the design and construction process is substantially less, thereby surely ensuring that the amount of value that the owner, occupier, investor can get over 20 years from the, his or her building. Start here, the Japanese way, start here with value, understand what really creates value for the customer and then pull through a process. The likely conclusion of a future process in this industry would be you would spend a lot more time at the beginning. Plan, 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 sir, as the Japanese contractors consistently said to me when we, when we were there. Point two on design, to spend maybe 1.1 on construction, to spend about three on operation of the building, so I've already saved my money, to get, maybe they need, maybe these people will be significantly more productive, we can employ the same number of people actually in our business, but boy oh boy will they be more productive in this beautiful new office building which has had enough time to think about what the business really needs to be successful. If you think that's too theoretical, how about the educational outcome because this is exactly what Building Schools for the Future in practice was about. Um, and if you think that's too theoretical, my favourite demonstration project, which was environmental sustainability, was St Francis of Assisi Academy in Liverpool, designed to be green. And it could be said, had all the bells and whistles of green as well, um, two years later was the best school in the country. It works, this stuff. This is the vision, this is what we're here for. The customer really wants long-term, whole life, value and if they don't yet realize that's what they want that's what they need to be helped to have a conversation about it does not make sense at least of all in the current market conditions to buy anything on some sort of lowest lump sum tender tender price and who else is going to save this planet of ours anyway it's our industry that can do that thank you very much Cheers.